Hey, and welcome back to another episode of Stellar Sound Podcast. I'm your host, Justin Williams. You know what it is, guys. Over in Stellar Sound Podcast, we take everyone from Europe, we bring them to my home country of Canada, I interview them, and then we spread them back to Europe, because that's what we do in this place, baby. We just shake it up as we do all the time. Now, ladies and gentlemen, my next guest today is somebody who I had the pleasure of interviewing not too long ago. They are disgustingly talented, a wonderful person, and by God, do they come with technical difficulties, but we love her just the same. Ladies and gentlemen, if you were watching us on Instagram Live a month and a half ago, you would notice that I was interviewing a beautiful woman by the name of Anne Van Dam. Her voice is beautiful, her ability to play music is captivating, her lyrics are out of this world, and you know what? I think I almost be able to call her a friend. We talk to each other on Instagram, it's pretty good, pretty decent. I'd house her for Christmas, why not? Have some tea? Biscuits? Sure, let's do it all. Because we're Canadian, and that's what we do. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let me introduce to you the wonderfully talented Miss Anne Van Dam, how you doing? Wow, thank you. I'm doing well. How are you? Amazing. So how have you been since we last spoke? Yeah, I've been good. I've been enjoying summer here. It's, it's well, there's been a lot of rain. It's still the Netherlands, of course. But we've also had a lot of uh, good warm days. So I love that. But I've also been working a lot. I'm actually working on a songwriting course, an online songwriting course. So that's been taking up a lot of my time. Ooh, tell us all about that. It's something that I've been wanting to do for a really long time. And actually, uh, a year and a half ago, I started a Dutch podcast about songwriting. And that was purely to sort of start people being interested in what I had to say about songwriting and eventually maybe buy one of my courses. But the course didn't exist back then. So that's a year and a half ago, like right when the pandemic started. That's when I thought, well, I now have the time to do this. So I uh, eventually... One and a half year later, I do finally have my songwriting course. Well, congratulations. I would sign up, but I don't speak Dutch. So pushing forward. Now, some people couldn't join us for the interview. So some people know who you are. Some people don't know who you are. So we're going to treat everyone like they're five years old and have the memory of a goldfish. (laughs) Aside from your songwriting course, tell the audience who you are and what is it you do? Well, I think the main thing that I do is is I'm a singer-songwriter. I have been writing songs ever since I was little. And uh, when I was little, I I couldn't write music, but I did sing and I wrote a lot of lyrics, even when I was just a little kid. And then when I was 13, I started playing guitar. So that's when I finally first got to combine the two. And that's when I immediately started writing songs. And writing songs for me is, it's the place where I feel at home. It's when I'm writing, I feel like that's what I'm supposed to do in life in general. So basically everything I do is sort of focused on that. So it's writing my own songs, but it's also writing for companies or other people, people who want to surprise their husband with a song, you know, stuff like that, assignments. That's fun to do. And I also help other people with, yeah, sort of their journey uh, through music. So sometimes that's little kids who want to learn how to play an instrument. Sometimes it's adults who want to learn how to sing or write songs. So yeah, that's, that's basically my life. It's all about music and writing and creating songs. Wow, that is amazing because I can't do any of that. So I find people who do things I can't do to be stellar and out of this world, like this podcast. But you are creative though. <laughs> well, you yes. must be. I mean, uh, as a comedian, it is my job to make people laugh about dumb, random things. So perhaps you are correct. I appreciate you. I think that's creativity in in words as well. You'd probably be a really good uh, lyric writer. Tell you what, I'll write you a song, you sing it. (laughs) All right, deal. (laughs) I'll take your course with the translator and we'll see how this turns out. All right. (laughs) All right. So you had mentioned that you've been doing music for a while. How many, uh, like, do you have an album coming out? Do you have an album? Like, tell us about that. I have two EPs, so like short albums. They both have like six or seven songs. And they're from a while back. Like the first one came out in 2016. It was actually the year that I graduated from college. I studied at the Rock Academy, which is a school here in the Netherlands, to become a professional musician. Uh, So that was in 2016. My second came out in 2018. And I've actually been writing a lot. And there is enough material to record. Well, a lot, really a lot. Yeah, I'm planning on releasing three EPs next year. And they sort of all come together in one album. So there are three parts of the same project. So I'm planning that. I want to record it all at home. 
I'm um, looking into investing more in a home studio. So there isn't as much as a, a hassle to go into the studio. I just want to be like, oh, I feel like recording today. My voice is doing its thing. I just, I want to record right now. I, I really want to experience that instead of having to rent a studio and someone else has to be there to, how you say, like, like an engineer, because I don't know how all those big audio tables work. So you need someone who, uh, who does. So I really want to make it easier for myself to record and I'm working towards that. And I'm really positive that next year there will be three EPs and that will be like one album uh, that will be coming out. Wow. It's like a three in one trilogy there, almost like Star Wars. You know what I mean? Like a box set of Anne. <laughs> I like to think about it as uh, Lord of the Rings more. Not much of a Star Wars girl, but Lord of the Rings, yeah. <laughs> I'm not much of a Lord of the Rings guy. So this concludes the interview. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nice knowing you. Yeah, nice, Bye. nice knowing you. Forget everything I said about her. Uh, never mind. Her tastes are all flawed. <laughs> but I'm, I'm glad you like uh, Lord of the Rings. I, I do appreciate people who do enjoy it because, you know, living in a fantasy world is always great. Mm-hmm, definitely. Just like Star Wars. So there's that. But one thing I don't like about Lord of the Rings, I know we're getting a bit off topic here and my boss is going to kill me. I just don't like how everything walks in that movie. I don't like how the trees walk. I'm sorry. I said it. Trees shouldn't walk, but they walk in that show and it bothers me. All right. But it's Star Wars. That's the one with like the, the big hairy monster, right? That does like Chewbacca. That's, that's, that's Star Wars, right? Yeah. I mean, that shouldn't talk either. He doesn't talk. He growls. Doesn't he? Yeah, him and uh, Harrison Ford kind of <laughs> talk a lot. No, I do, I do like the trees. As you should. <laughs> okay. So on a day-to-day -day life, describe to us your writing process. Like, do you wake up? Do you have coffee? And do you go, oh, this coffee reminds me of a jingle I want to put down. Like, tell us about it. Well, first of all, I don't drink coffee. I hate coffee. But I try to have a routine. So I think when I was younger, songwriting was always something that just happened out of inspiration. And I do it a lot because I had a lot of time when I was younger and I was still in high school, uh, especially like on summer holiday, I, I would just sit up in my attic room and write songs. So I'd have a lot of time and I would write a lot. But, you know, as you get older and uh, you get more responsibilities, you don't really have that time unless you make it. So what I try to do is I try to make writing a habit. So I also go for a walk every day and I brush my teeth every day. So those are things that I do. And when I don't do them, I don't feel good. So I try to approach writing the same. And it doesn't always work like that because sometimes I just don't really feel like it. But it's not a thing anymore where I just have to sit and wait for inspiration. So I do try and practice writing a lot, like at least several days a week. And sometimes it's just practice songs that come out, uh, songs about really random things that won't go anywhere, that I won't use for anything. I've just used them for practicing. And sometimes I sit down and my next favorite song for the new album comes out. Ooh, don't we love that inspiration? Yeah, yeah, we do. And I think that happens because I sit down that often. I think you make it easier for yourself to get inspired. You know, the more you get into that state of mind, the easier it will be. I was going to say, so like, I'm glad you brought this up because as a comedian, I like to write every day as well. And there's a group I joined called Write 10. And in that, it's for 10 minutes a day at 10 o'clock, they give us a word of the day and we write about it. And that is a great way to kickstart your brain and what you do. And I'm sure you could almost do the same thing with music. You could sit down and be like, all right, I need something to write about. And you can have writer's block when it comes to topics, which happens a lot with comedians, because unfortunately, a lot of topics get kind of, just like in the music industry, get kind of used and, re and repetitive. So like, for instance, today's word of the day was, I actually haven't looked, but let's say the word onion, and you just write a joke about onion. So I don't know, I wonder if there's something in the music industry that could do the same for you guys, or if you guys, instead of the word of the day, have like a topic of the day or something. You know what I mean? Yeah, there is actually. There's this guy his name is Patterson. He's, he's not just any guy. He's like a professor at Berkeley University uh, for Music in somewhere in England, I guess. But he's, uh, he's sort of famous and he has this book called Writing Better Lyrics, which is like one of the first books that people buy when they want to do something with songwriting. So obviously I have that book. And he talks about something that he calls object writing, which is actually 
uh, something that you also do every day for like 10 or 15 minutes. You just sit down and you pick an object in the room and you have to write, it about, write about it for 10 minutes straight and you can't stop. So you can't stop to think about anything. You can't plan. You just have to keep writing for 10 minutes or 15 minutes. Like You can make it longer as you get better at it. And he talks a lot about how you have to use all the senses. So for instance, if I talk about a glass of water, if that's my object for the day, I can write about how it looks, how it tastes. Uh, but I can also use my imagination and I can write about what it would feel like to jump into that glass of water if I was a tiny person. So it's a starting point and you use all your senses and your imagination to get to somewhere completely different. And if you do that every day, it literally like expands where you can go with your words. I was going to say, I never once thought about writing a joke about water where I'm inside of it. I would have to look like a pool as opposed to a glass of water. That's interesting. I like that. Now, we were discussing problems that you're having when it comes to, um, you know, not having an, a studio at home and going out to a studio. So you're going to solve that problem by making it like a studio at your place. But what other problems have you encountered when it comes to either recording an album, to recording a song? <laughs> well, I think that sort of sums it up. Like, one thing that's difficult for me is working with other people. I don't really like to work with other people. And it sounds like I don't like people, like I'm antisocial. I'm not. I love people, but not really when it comes to my own music. But the problem is that I don't have all of the knowledge. Like I said, when I go into like a big professional studio, I don't really know how to make myself sound good. I don't really know because there's just too much going on. So I need somebody for that. And it's not the end of the world, obviously, to hire someone to do that for you because they're professionals and they know what they're doing. So you're going to sound good. But for some reason, it's always some sort of an obstacle for me. I don't really want to do it. So by investing in my own microphones, we already have a sort of built-in studio in her home right now because the people who lived here before us, they had a son who was a drummer. So they have this sort of soundproof room, which is perfect. No, but I think when it comes to uh, recording and also releasing things, I'm very much a DIY person. I really love to do things myself, but you are your biggest obstacle. I think your yourself is what gets in the way the most. So what I notice is, is that I don't really want to work when I don't feel like working. And sometimes when things get a little bit too big, like when they, when I feel like, oh, I really need to do this right. Otherwise this or that will happen or this will all be for nothing. That's when it sort of paralyzes me. So that's definitely an obstacle for me, not really wanting the help of others, but sometimes needing it or sometimes just being stuck in what you know, just not really getting anywhere. I think that's probably one of my biggest problems I encounter. Being stuck in limbo can also, yeah, it's brutal when you're stuck there. It's, it's not good, but it is what it is. And we always overcome it because we are determined and crazy. Hey, in this episode of Stellar Sound Podcast is brought to you in part by Dungeons and Dragons very own The Corruption of Cave Star. Now this was made by Faye, F-A-E Games. Totally awesome. I cannot stress how wonderful this book is. Down from the literature, down to what you actually have to do. At some point in the game, it's it tells you you have to go underneath the city into some weird kooky mines because people keep leaving you. And you're like, what the hell? I don't want to go into these mines. But you know what? You're the protagonist, so you're going to the damn mines. So bring some weapons with you. Have some friends, because this is going to be such a great time. I cannot stress to you enough how wonderful this game was. And I have no reason to lie to you guys. I don't know you, and I love Dungeons & Dragons. So when they asked me, hey Justin, do you want to read this and then talk about it if you like it? I'm like, hell yeah. So I did that, and you know what? I went back to them and I said, yeah, I can support this. I can get 100% behind this. This is an awesome, awesome RPG. And this specific one, The Corruption of Cave Star, I think it's probably the best. And it rolls well with 5 and 3.5. Typically, you're supposed to use it for 5, but, I mean, nobody's splitting hairs. You might be able to roll it with 3.5 as well if you make some modifications to it. Um, if you're interested, you can find a digital copy at Drive Through RPG or order exclusively the physical copies through the podcast. You know, we'll hook you up. We got you guys. Don't forget, that's Faye, F-A-E-Games.com. Go check them out. Go give them a look. See what you can do. 
Digital copies, they're just as good as the physical copies, guys. Please enjoy. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, can you imagine telling your parents, being like, hey, I want to go into a career which isn't guaranteed to make me a lot of money or money at all, but it's my passion. <laughs> yeah, I think my parents always saw it coming, really, because from the age of 13, I was obsessed with my guitar and obsessed with writing songs. And I know that, you know, we had these career days at school where you had to go and talk with all these people who were promoting their colleges and their studies. And, and I never really found what I really wanted. Like there's uh, creative psychology, uh, for example, which I do find interesting, but not as interesting as actually doing the creative part. That's really what I wanted to do. So I always had these backup things, but they never really, they were never really it. And I think my parents always knew that. So they weren't as surprised when I really wanted to do what I'm doing right now. And I do think that, you know, since I graduated, that's five years ago. And I think at first they were a little, a little worried, like, is she making any money? <laughs> but I think now they, they know that I am and that I can but, you know, we, we have enough to live from and we never really have to worry like, oh, no, uh, my gig is canceled and now I can't buy groceries. Like that's, that's never really the case. So we're sort of smart about it. We don't, um, I say we because my boyfriend is a musician too, but we do have this vision of really being an entrepreneur as well. Not just a musician, not just somebody who does only like reckless things and just plays music for fun. Like, obviously we find this fun. I find this fun. But it's also a business, and I do really see it that way. It's a really fun business, but it's still business. Exactly. And it's we are entrepreneurs, right? Any entertainer, comedian, actors, writer, doesn't matter. You, you are your own business. You have to market yourself, right? So, and that, that's good. I love to hear that too, where, you know, you're making ends meet and you're living decently well, which, you know, brings joy to people who are new to this, who may be like worried about it. It's just kind of follow your heart and the money will follow. That's what I love so much about this. Yeah. I also think, you know, a lot of people, like even my own family, not my mother, not my sister, but like the, my aunts and uncles, they sometimes, they don't really understand what it is that I do. Like, oh, you, you play music and huh? You just bought a house. Like, how is this possible? Like for some reason they can't really connect those two and they don't really understand that it is a business. And I think that's also one of the things that people forget that you don't have to be extremely famous to be able to say you have made it. I mean, that's what a lot of people ask you, right? Like, when are you going to get your big break? I don't really need a big break. I think I'd be paralyzed if I ever got a big break. <laughs> so please don't give me a big break. Lots of people ask me, why don't you go and sing on The Voice of Holland? Things like that. And, you know, fame is not something that makes for a career. Like you have to build your career from the ground up. You can't start at the bottom and then, you know, there's no foundation. If you start at the bottom, if you just skyrocket and become famous, there's nothing really to show for it. You want to have a sustainable career. So by not being extremely famous, I mean, I'm not saying that I'll never be famous, but I hope not. I hope I'll never be that I can't walk down the street. I hope that never happens. And I don't think it will. I think if I really want that, I... I do things differently, definitely, because uh, what I do isn't, I think it isn't as marketable, as profitable as what some other singer-songwriters do. And that's fine, because this is exactly what I want to do, and this is what I can keep doing, because this is what I love to do. So I can do it for years and years and years and build a sustainable career out of it. And that's fantastic. I do explain to my parents, too, being a comedian, it's not like yeah, it'd be nice to get your own special. And I feel like every comedian at some point should record an hour special just so you can almost showcase it to a degree. But you don't need like the big things like Netflix or Crave or Hulu or all that stuff. YouTube has worked well for a lot, a lot of comedians. Mark Norman, Sam Morell, Joe List. Netflix wouldn't give them a special because they're just generic white guys. So that's literally what they told them. So they put their stuff on, uh, on uh, YouTube and they have millions of views now. Uh, they grew their fan base exponentially. And they're like, okay, cool, this was great. But they also have like years of work to do. If you go on Spotify, you can find albums that they've recorded previously. So it's like, oh, there's more to this onion. You know what I mean? There's layers to this. Let's go back and see their older stuff. How have they changed? How they mature? And you're right. Like if your first album is a hit, that's all they know. They don't know the struggle and the growth of you, right? Which I think that journey is so much more rewarding than just hearing the final product. Yeah. 
I think it is. Yeah, you, you can't just be one thing. If that's the only thing you have, like one good album, then really what is your worth? I think, you know, you don't, you don't really learn, you don't really know how to do things unless you do them for a while and you really get those things into your system. And it doesn't mean that, you know, sometimes people do exist, uh, they have like a first album that does really well which is amazing. It's not like, I'm not against success, not at all. But I just, I feel sad for all the people who do really well without having that major success in the spotlight, without having like the whole nation watching them. And then other people sort of don't value their art as much just because they don't get played on the radio all the time. It's not really what music is about, I think. And that's the thing. In the entertainment world, you make it, there's an expression. You make it when you're 20 or you make it when you're 40. Yeah. So I, I fully agree with that. You know, in and around your 20s, you can make it or in and around your 40s, you make it. Yeah. There's obviously outliers, but. But I think we should also question ourselves. What do we mean when we say we're going to make it? Because I know when I was like 16 or 70 years old, what I wanted to do is I wanted to perform. I wanted to record my own albums. And I didn't necessarily want to do anything else. So that's what I wanted to earn my money with. And it's sort of what I'm doing right now. Like if it wasn't for the pandemic, I would be playing. I've recorded my albums. I'm going to record another one. Well, I've also picked up teaching because it's actually something that I really do like to do. So really, you know, if that's sort of what you're basing it on, then I've already made it. Mm -hmm, you have. I think you would. Yeah. So, you know, it's weird when people ask me, it's, it's sort of like they don't really value what I'm doing right now. I'm like, you know what? I, I have a business. I'm doing my thing. <laughs> so why would you say that, uh, that I haven't made it? Of course, I'm thinking bigger. I always want more. I want to grow. I definitely want to reach more listeners. That really is still a dream for me that will come through, I think, with every little piece of me that I put out there, you know, the, the fan base, if that's what you want to call it, it grows and it doesn't need to grow super fast. That doesn't need to happen, but it just needs to keep on growing and growing and growing like every week, every month, every year, you know, it adds up. And as long as you keep building, I think you really get somewhere. That slow burn. Now you had mentioned that uh, your fan base growing and everything's growing, but I imagine your musical instrument percussions and, and all that fun stuff, your outlet of what you use is growing too. What was your go-to instrument before? Like let's say Gibson guitar. And then what is it now? Well, my go-to instrument was always my guitar. I have a Yamaha guitar, like uh, one of the stage ones, the, the APX. But actually I've been playing, especially for the last year i think i've been playing a lot of piano and that's a big change for me like i'm not really i'm not really into gear like i don't really know all the brands and names of the of the stuff that i'm using but obviously i can distinguish between a guitar and a piano so uh, i've been playing a lot of piano uh, lately it's very interesting what that does because i still don't see myself as a good piano player obviously i get better at it but at this point i don't think i do a performance with it i don't really feel secure enough to perform on stage with a piano or a keyboard but i do play it a lot like almost daily and the interesting thing is when you write on an instrument that you don't really well i know how to use it but not really pretty when i play guitar i can sort of hide that the song isn't really interesting by using a very interesting strumming pattern, for example. But because I don't know how to do that on piano, all that there is for me to do is to make the song itself actually interesting. So I can't really use my fingers because I don't, I don't know all the fun patterns. Like the only thing I do is I put down chords. That's basically what I do. And I make them sometimes faster and slower. That's basically what it is. So. If you only have your chords and your voice, then the song that you're writing has to be interesting. So it actually has led me to use lots of different chords that don't really fit in the key of the song or you know that I normally on guitar wouldn't necessarily pick, but it actually expanded my vision in, oh, this is a possibility as well, just because other things aren't a possibility. So by limiting yourself, 
I think you can expand your vision as well. Ooh, I love that. By limiting yourself, you can expand your vision. That's a very oxymoronic sentence, and I love yeah. that. <laughs> Yo, let's have that quoted on this. People who are listening, quote that. Write it down. Write it down. Write down. Write down. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I've recorded a few quick yes or no questions for you, but like modified, so they're not actually yes or no. It's just would you rather, and you have to pick one, like A and B. All right. There's not very many. So it'll be very quick. And you have to give your first answer. I don't need an explanation. I just need a first answer. All right. Okay, ready? Ready? Yeah. Cat or dog? Dog. Blueberry tea or orange pico tea? Orange. You're gross. Blueberry tea is the way to go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yamaha guitar, Gibson guitar? Yamaha. Netflix special of your concert or private selling DVD of your concert? Netflix. As you should. Okay. Final question. Album where it's just you or album where you feature high profile artists? Album where it's just me. I like that choice. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I thoroughly enjoy an average, like a guest casually on, but however, yeah. it's like, I find when there's too many guests, I'm like, is this a collaborative album? Like, what is this? Yeah, exactly. Like, I, um, when I was younger, I'd get really excited to see my favorite bands guest experience appearances of, of other bands like i got really excited like oh that's so cool let's do my favorite bands together but i think when it comes to what i do i'd love to do like a like a real collaboration album sometime love to do that but not right now it just it doesn't feel like it's the right time i still have a lot of things to say that i just want to do by myself mm -hmm. which is what you should do i mean focus on yourself first and everyone else will follow so last but not least, I do want to ask two other questions. Number one, what is your guilty pleasure in life? And number two, can you give me the story behind your Instagram profile picture? Oh, wow. My guilty pleasure in life. Well, we talked about this in the other interview, but I don't really know if I should call it a guilty pleasure, but sometimes I feel like I should because I love playing The Sims. And you found that out somehow. I still don't know how you knew that. <laughs> but that really, it's, it's, I just, I really like that. Like The Sims 4, they have all these new expansions. I, I just, I love doing that. I love building houses and I love to play with my family and make these tiny people have lives and all sorts of lives that I myself wouldn't really want or have. I just, I get sucked into it. Like I really, I have to tell myself, okay, I have to do work first and then, uh, like in the evening, I can play because I, I shouldn't play during the day. <laughs> that's the, that's not a good idea for me. Exactly. Work first and then party after. Yeah. yeah and I party with The Sims. Hell yeah, girl. <laughs> and uh, about your Instagram profile. Tell us the story behind that. Well, it's me with my guitar and it's at the central station of Utrecht, which is a city in the middle of the Netherlands. It's like the biggest train station we have because all other trains end up there. And I was doing an interview. There was a woman, I don't remember her name. This is actually a couple of years ago. I believe Annabelle, something like that. But she was interviewing female entrepreneurs for a book or a website she was writing. I don't really remember. I don't think it ever was published um, but she she was asking female entrepreneurs like what is it that you do and what are your core beliefs when it comes to entrepreneurship so that was a really fun interview and then afterwards she wanted to do like a photo shoot to publish with the interview which i don't think was ever published but i did get the photos and i'm still using those photos like every day so on my profile picture or even on my website so i really i really like those because i think it makes me they really portray me as, as what I am. Like it's me with my guitar and I think they look very, very strong. And, and that's what I like about it. It's not just, I don't know, it's it's not too girly. It's, it's a little a little tougher, I feel, at least for my liking. So that's what I really like about those pictures. They make me seem strong, like a, like a businesswoman almost. I was going to say, I feel like you are very strong in those photos. It very definitely seems like you know what you're doing and what you want to do. It looks like you're already living your dream, so you're beating more than half the people in the world who try to put us down. I do feel like I should explain that that is often how I feel, but also very often it's not what I feel. And I think that's very human of us 
to have doubts and to not always believe in yourself and to have off days or off weeks or off months. And, you know, often when you, when you hear people talking in a podcast or on YouTube, you, or even on Instagram, you see only the good things. And they tell you about their successes and they tell you, oh yeah, I once failed this thing and then this good thing came out of it. And I feel like uh, we don't always see the the big picture. And even on my Instagram account, like when I, I feel like shit, which does happen like frequently, I don't post. So I don't really want to share at that point. And I don't force myself to share because I think, yeah, that's not really a fun thing to share. But that also means that you don't see it. If somebody follows me, they don't see my off days because I don't really feel like posting those. So I think it's important that we also mention that they exist and that you don't always feel like, you know, you're conquering the world. Sometimes you feel like, oh, I just want to lay on the couch and play The Sims. <laughs> exactly. There are days which humble us and days which excel us. Oh, that's a beautiful saying. <laughs> Thank you. It's something Did I... you come up with that? Right now, this very second. Oh, <laughs> All right, print it on a t-shirt. <laughs> we'll have yours in the front and mine on the back. It'll be good. Yeah, good deal. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen. So that's our time for this episode from uh, Stellar Sound Podcast. I just want to give a huge shout out to everybody who's part of this Stellar Sound Podcast team, down to our editors, our marketing people, the managers behind the scene, people who put up with me and my wacky ass schedule. Just thank you from the bottom of my heart. You guys make this what it is. You guys give me the opportunity to sit down with these wonderful artists and speak with them. And you guys get the opportunity as like the people behind the scenes to watch your baby grow and become an adult and eventually leave the nest. I don't know where it's going, but it's leaving the nest in this situation. And thank you so much for joining me again. Um, you're the first. Thank you. Thank you. You're the first guest I've had done twice. And uh, it was an honor to have you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. I had a good time. All right, guys. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, I can't wait for this episode to come out. All right. Thank you. Thank you.